desire and or attempt to own something. And now we'll be looking at lust, um, which if you've been if you picked up a copy of that book, I forgot to grab it. Um, that we're reading out of um, Richard Foster's *The Challenge of the Disciplined Life*. Um, he doesn't broaden it out as I am. He keeps it with um, money, sex, and power. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to broaden it because I think that um, the issue isn't the money, the sex, or the power. I think it's the attitude that goes behind that. And we'll kind of expand on this a little bit when we talk about um, – uh, um, oh, how, how do I want to say that? Um, we'll look at some of Bill Gothard's um, ideas and charts. Well, we won't really get too much into him. I know a lot of people have mixed feelings about Bill Gothard. Never really going to look too much at him. Just some of the charts that he shows I want to kind of uh, bring in. And we'll look at that in the future. But um, I think more broadly, um, greed and, and lust, you know, we're actually talking about more concepts rather than a narrowly defined thing. So anyways, um, and we talked about how to overcome greed. Um, living simply, remember, rather than trying to live extravagant, rather than trying to keep up with, with the Kardashians, we're, 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 we're saying, okay, we don't have to live like that. Right. We don't have to beat ourselves you know, to death trying to get all these things that the world is so enamored with. We don't, we don't have to do that. So instead, we're going to choose to live simply. Less is more. Instead of you know, chasing down money, we're going to be happy and content with what we have, right? And then we talked about the second way to overcome greed was to give much, thankfully and persistently. Mm -hmm. Something about giving over the course of time just softens us up, especially when we start doing it out of the thankfulness of our heart rather than out of the greediness of our heart. Remember, we were talking about how we can give and still be greedy. Remember that. Um, but anyways, so um, that brings us to the question of the week. And I don't necessarily want you guys to try and answer this this week. I just want to keep this question rolling around in your heads. What is lust? If greed is the desire and or attempt to own something, this is mine. What is lust then? I mean, think about it. Uh, you, you don't really hear Christians talk about lust a whole lot as far as, you know, what does the Bible say and, you know, things like masturbation and stuff. It's kind of like a areas that we don't really talk about. And uh, so it kind of leaves us with this blank here. Well, we know what sex is, but what is lust? You know what I mean? It, it kind of goes to, to the next level. So then with that, how do you overcome lust if we can't even clearly define what lust is? I mean, because it kind of it kind of opens up that idea, and where we need to seriously stop and ask ourselves, what is it that we believe? Do you really believe in your heart that pornography is wrong? Do you really believe in your heart that sex is only for marriage? Do you really believe in your heart? See what I mean? If we don't deal with these things, and if we don't look at what the Bible has to say, who's going to define it for us? The culture? See, I mean, if we let social media guide us on that, we're going to be awful lost. Especially if you listen to songs by like uh, Jay Z and Kanye West, you're gonna be really lost. Uh. <laughs> so, um, the first thing I want to look at with this is that God made us as sexual beings. Now, I'm not talking about sexual as in sex. I'm talking about sexual as in. Let me let me back up. Our culture defines sexuality as what? Intercourse between a man and a woman, right? Or, or actually between anything, really, at this point. Um, that's sexuality. But the Bible doesn't define sexuality like that. The Bible defines sexuality as um, relationship between one another, friendships. You know what I mean? And, and the way that you have friends in your life, right? That's part of your sexuality. You need, you need um, relationships. You, you, need, you need to talk to people. Have you ever met recluses, people who don't have friends who don't get out? How they're just kind of, you know, weird homeschoolers. <laughs> just um, but y y you know what I mean? People, people need that. We, we, we need to feel um, like we belong. We need to feel like we have people who, um, who are with us and tr who truly know us. You know what I mean? And the sad thing is, is the culture constantly tells us, that, tells us that we can only find that in sex. And that's just such an unbiblical idea of sexuality. Sexuality is what you feel when you're worshiping God and, and you cry. Sexuality is what you feel when you're eating with a friend and you're just having a good time. Sexuality is what you feel when you go out to the movies with a friend. It doesn't have to be about sex. 
That is our sexuality. The, we feel, we think, that's our sexuality. We, the animals don't have that. We have that. See what I mean? Animals have personality in the sense that, that they feel things like fear or, or, or happiness, but they don't get the free will that, that people do. They don't share in that sexuality like we do. And so what, what's happened in our culture is they've reduced that sexuality to sex. That's it. It's such a hollow definition when you compare it with the, the fullness of what God made us to be. So, our sexuality, that love, that relationship, that knowledge, that, that who we are is related to our creation. If you look at the uh, account in Genesis, chapter 1, verse 27, it, um, it, it says some very interesting things that, that, um, that I think um, are oftentimes overlooked because we know Genesis, the first couple chapters of Genesis. So God created man in his own image. Now remember, God doesn't have a physical body. Remember that. So what is it talking here that, that they were made in his image? See, I mean, we share traits with God that nothing else on this planet shares. That sexuality that we, we can know, we can discern what's right and wrong, right? We can, we can think, we can feel things. That's something that we share uniquely with God. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He created as unique as we are. Men, your men, women, your your women. God made you that way. So then, what we do is our culture says, okay, well, if you do things that is girly, that's not right. Women, if you do things that are boyish, that's not right. We're all unique, each one of us. See so, you know what I mean? If you feel like sewing, if that's if that's something that you enjoy doing, there's there's nothing wrong with that. See so, you know I mean? Uh, girls, if you like shooting a gun, there's there's nothing wrong with that. See so, you know I mean? Like. We've narrowed down our sexuality so much, but that's part of who you are. You're, you see what I mean? We weren't all created to be the exact same. Not every girl wants to be a princess. That's okay. See what I mean? That's that's all right because that's part of our sexuality. That's part of who we are. Um, and so once again, get past the idea of sex as sexuality. Sex is a very small part of our sexuality. And what, what, what we try to do is we try to, de to deny our sexuality – and then we take that into either our life of marriage or our life of being single, and it causes great imbalances because we don't actually come to terms with who we are. So, um, <coughs> pornography, people oftentimes say something like this. Pornography, it, it, takes, it takes our sexuality and it puts it on drugs. It, it's like cocaine for your sexuality. No. The exact opposite. Pornography doesn't emphasize our sexual, sexuality enough. It hollows it. Pornography takes our beautiful sexuality and narrows it to the confines of this video about these two people that you had nothing to do with having sex. See what I mean? In marriage, there's this, there's this wholeness that is found in sex. There is this really nice connection that you share and you don't share with anyone else. It is yours and your spouse's alone. Nobody else needs to know. It stays with you two. It's your own business. There's just this beautiful thing about that. And what pornography does is it takes that that one-on-one -on -one connection that you make with somebody, and it makes it everybody else's business. And then it makes – instead of that connection that you feel in love, it makes it a thing about lust, something else that you can achieve or dominate, something else that, that you need. See what I mean? It, it, it takes that beauty of sex, hollows our sexuality, and that's what it is. Well, that's a very, very unbiblical definition of what our sexuality is. It's a very hollow definition. Um, the overemphasis on genital sex is foreign to the biblical perspective, but I already talked about that. Um, we see a few different things with man, with man and woman being created. The first is that they were interdependent. Chapter 2, verse 21 so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and uh, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So the first thing we see is interdependence. The man isn't dominant over the wife, and the wife is not dominant over the man, are they? They're created, God makes them, they're interdependent. And then for the offspring, they depend on each other too. The woman needs the man's seed, but the sa but the man's seed need the woman needs the woman's egg. They're interdependent. They need each other. See what I mean? And, and so God makes this 
th this nice little um, equality between them. And we're talking here specifically about relationships, um, as far as like marriage. Is this still in Genesis? Yes, 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 it is. Um, we're not really talking about um, the idea of you know uh, friendships broadly. We're talking specifically about relationships. Um, so, so in the in the idea of the relationships, um, they were interdependent. But this does still apply to other people more broadly. Chuck, for instance, is not married, right? However. He still is going to need that sexuality of a friendship. I'm not talking about sex here. I'm talking about that that um, talking to people. You know what I mean? Re relaying thoughts and, con and convictions to somebody. You know what I mean? We weren't made. We God didn't make us to be in isolation from one another. And, and you really see this a lot in the New Testament, especially. But anyways, um, and then the second thing that you see here is that they were united. Look what it says in verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and then shall become one flesh. Now, I know it's been said, oh, well, it never says that the woman has to do that. Well, that's because in the context of Genesis, the woman was already expected to have abandoned her family for the sake of the man. So what this is saying is, okay, yeah, that's not wrong. Your wife should abandon her family. But you men, you should also do this. See? Instead of saying, wives, you have to abandon your families, but men... You can let whatever you want come between you and your wife. See, instead of that, it said, okay, that's great that your wives are separating themselves from their families for the sake of their husband. But, men, you also need to do this because you are no longer that too, but you are one. You have been bound together. How does this oneness happen? Between the covenant that you make before God and this person of your full self consummated with sex. This is very much so dependent on sex. Sex is what makes two separate people, as they've made their covenant before God in a marriage, become one flesh. It's a very intimate thing. Once again, why pornography is so destructive, it, it, it destroys that. It's supposed to be that intimacy between you and your spouse that nobody else shares. And what happens is people go from relationship to relationship having sex with multiple people. And every time you have sex with someone, you're, you're, you're becoming one flesh with them. Paul talks about this when he's talking about not, not having sex with the uh, uh, temple priestesses uh, in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Um, the, you're, you're binding yourself with that person. You're becoming one flesh. And so if you keep going around to these different people, you're, you're, you're giving away parts of yourself. You know what I mean? That, that, that oneness that's supposed to be between you and one person has now been scattered abroad. You know what I mean? Think of it as you are a thing of paint. And the different people that you have sex with are like paintbrushes. If you dip a paintbrush into, into, into paint and you pull it back out, part of that paint is going to be stuck to that, right? And it's going to drip all over the floor and whatnot as it goes, right? Exact same thing with sex. When you unite yourself with someone... You're, you're mixing your paint colors. They can't be unmixed. See what I mean? So, um, they were united. Um, there was nothing that came before these two people. These two people were one together. They were one in purpose. They were one, one in... One in um, and I can't think of the word that I'm thinking of, but I'll just stop with there. They were one in purpose. Uh, they were united. So then, and we go to the next verse... And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. God's system involved no shame. See what I mean? God made this beautiful thing, and then he seals it with this. They were not ashamed. It was okay. And so what's going to happen is after the fall, some of these things are going to change. Sex is now a little bit more awkward now than it was back then. See what I mean? Because of the issue of sex. Even if you marry as a virgin, you're still going to feel awkward having sex with your wife or husband for the first time. Or even if you've slept around. On the wedding night, there's a certain awkwardness that's going to come. Why? Because we're part of a fallen creation now. See what I mean? Even though it's there's nothing wrong with sex in, 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 the, in the binds of marriage, um, it still is going to feel a little bit more awkward than it was at this point. Because at this point, sin was not a part of them. See what I mean? And, and now, it ha now sin is a part of us. Um, so, excuse me. So they were interdependent, they were united, and there was no shame involved. Okay, this is actually very important because what's going to happen later on is 
there's going to be a lot of conflict between the man and the woman because of what, what happens next, which you guys know about. Um, you know, Adam and Eve uh, sin, and they're they're um, removed from the Garden of Eden. Um, so some of the uh, effects of sin, just a few chapters over in chapter 6, verse 2. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. So what happens here a few generations later? They're taking all kinds of wives for themselves. That one looks good. That one looks good. That one looks good. There, there's no... The, there's no oneness there. See what I mean? The, the men are prostituting themselves by combining themselves with all these different women. And then we see the effects of this in verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. Great, God's greatly displeased with the fact that the men are just going around taking whatever women they want. He's very displeased with this. So obviously, if God, for God to, get such a re to get such a reaction from God... Probably didn't like the idea of, uh, you know what I mean, of sexuality being just flaunted like that. So the first thing, perverted sexuality. But then if you back up to chapter 3, verse 16, we see something else that happened too. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. And he does a similar thing with the men. Now they have to, now they have to till, uh, till the land uh, by the sweat of their brow. There's the issue of... Um, of weeds and that kind of stuff that that, that become a thing that, that's going to be a constant thorn in the guy's flesh as they have to do have to work the land, and the women have to have the childbearing pain. But here it says this: In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, what does that mean? That means between man and woman, there's going to be an issue of power from this day on. The woman's always going to want to take the role, and the man's always going to want to take the role. All of a sudden, what did we see on the last on the last slide? Interdependent, united, unashamed. Now these things have completely cha changed. A, they're now ashamed and they're they're covering themselves because they, they realize that they're nude. And God's like, "Who told you that you were nude?" See, what I mean, because sin was there, it changed the way they were thinking. Second, um, they they're no longer going to be united. They're still going to be interdependent. Obviously, we can't have sex with ourselves and create a child. Obviously. <laughs> so they're still going to be interdependent. But now, instead of that equality and uni being united in that, there's now going to be a, a, a tiff, an issue of power between them, which is where we get the third theme that we're going to be looking at probably in about two months. We looked at greed, we, we looked at lust, then we'll look at the issue of power of the last, okay? Um, <clears throat> so the relationship was strained. Um, and, and so because of this, because of this fallenness, there's going to be two major results. The first one is, is what, what the world does, the people who don't seek God. What, what are they going to do with this? Well, they're going to they're gonna partake of what, a very evil sexuality. They're going to remove all of the specialness from it, and they're going to make it all about general sex. That's it. Everybody's having sex with everybody, and you know what? We're going to live, live however we want. doesn't matter. God's standard of what he created is no longer beneficial for us. We can have sex with animals, uh, same sex, people we're not married to. We can accumulate multiple wives. So, I mean, all these different things that God never intended for. And all of it is an effect of that, of that fall. But then the church, the, the, God's people are going to do something equally as, as evil. They're going to try to remove sexuality from the equation. Why is this an evil thing? Anyway, why is this an evil thing for the church to do? Because it's something God created. Because it's something God created. God created the male and female. And what the church did is, okay, because the world is taking things too far, we're going to say no sexuality. It's not okay for you to have problems with depression. It's not okay for you to do all, the, all, all these things. It's not okay. Masturbation, I don't even care if less is involved or not. It's not okay. Pornography, not okay. Now, I'm not condoning pornography, and we'll talk about masturbation later. But my point being that the church went to the other extreme and said no sexuality whatsoever. See what I mean? So now we have two evils. And now, as a new generation, we're looking back on the past, and we're seeing the exact same thing before us as they saw back then. On one side, you see glorified sexuality. Everybody's just doing whatever sexual things they want. And on the other side, you're seeing people not even address sexuality. But that's who we are. We have to address it. We have to know what God says about these things, 
or else we're gonna go to the we're gonna react out of what we see rather than what God says. So um, that takes us to a very very special book, the Song of Songs, also called the Song of Solomon. You guys know how we call Jesus the King of Kings? Do you know what that means? Anybody? I always thought. Right, like the best of kings, the number one king. It's the same kind of idea with Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. It's the song above all the other songs. It's the best of songs. And why it's called the Song of Songs is because it's a love song between a husband and a wife. And uh, with that said, um, love is obviously all throughout the Bible it constantly condoned as, as a very good thing. Sadly, once again, because the church wanted to ostracize sexuality from humanity, because that's anything sexual is evil, right? right? So because of that, Song of Solomon couldn't be about husband and wife. We've got to make it mean something, anything else. Well, Paul talks about the church being Christ, the bride of Christ. Let's make it about the relationship between God and, and the church. Well, okay, that's great, but that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about marital love. See what I mean? So, let's look at this. Um, first off that we see is that the love was intense. Now, this is actually pretty important because being madly in love with someone isn't isn't wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. See what I mean? Ha having having sexual feelings for a person isn't wrong if it's in, in if it's in marriage. See what I mean? That, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. If you look at uh, chapter two, verse five, it says. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. There's this dialogue back and forth between this guy and this girl, and they're just flaunting about how much they care about each other. If uh, if this was high school, it would be PDA. <laughs> uh, so the first thing, it's intense. The second thing we see is that it is restrained. It is restrained. If you look at chapter 8, verse 10, I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. I was a wall. I wasn't a door. I was a wall. What she's saying is, I didn't let other people have my sexuality. I was a wall. Nobody, nobody, I didn't let anybody have me sexually. You, if you, if you want to know exactly why, right before that, he's um, in verse um, 8. We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. She's she's in, she's uh, not matured yet. She's a she's a young teenager, probably preteen. So we're talking about like eleven year old or something like that. Okay, what shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? On the day when when, when she's going to be married? If she is a wall, we will build on her battlements of silver. In other words, if she has kept herself pure, we will adorn this. It, it'll it'll be a great thing, an honorable thing. But if she is a door, where many people go in and out. We will enclose her with boards of cedar. Do you see the difference between honor and dishonor? What, what, what was the guiding thing? The guiding thing was, did she make herself a wall or a door? And so then we reach in verse 10. I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. I was fully mature and I kept myself pure. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. This was a good thing between the husband and the wife. It, it, was, it was a great thing between them. Um... So we see that the love is intense, but we see that it's also restrained, right? We don't just have sex with whoever, even in the confines of marriage, right? You don't, you, you can't, husbands can't, you know, this is how sex is going to be, and you just have to go with it. You know what I mean? It, it's supposed to be an equal thing between the husband and the wife, you know what I mean? Uh, an equal affirmation of their love, see you know what I mean? The woman's supposed to be... Giving herself, and the man's supposed to be giving himself. You know, it's not supposed to be marital rape. Okay, we'll talk about this later. But you know, in the process of history, because of male superiority, they've made it into this thing of literally like words, words, marital sex. I mean, marital rape, where the wife doesn't want to have sex, and it's like you will have sex with me. You know what I mean? It, it got dark places. But we'll talk about that next week if you're interested. Um, anyways, my my point being, it was restrained. It was restrained between these two people, and it was a mutual thing that they were doing. Uh, next up, it was it was patient. If you look in chapter three, verse five, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. You see, people nowadays they just can't wait to get into a relationship. 
They go from relationship to relationship. As soon as they're old enough to date, they do. In fact, sometimes before they're even able to date. Uh, was it you who was telling me about a 12-year-old that got pregnant? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I, I about threw up. That's got to be the grossest thing I've ever heard. Oh, my gosh. Anyways, but the idea that it's patient. See that? I'll, I'll read it again. And in, in chapter 3, verse 5, I adjure you, then let, go down into the, at the end of the verse, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Don't stir it up until and, until the time is right. So, anyways, um, it's intimate. It's very very much so one on one intimacy. Chapter four, verse sixteen. I'm sorry, that's oh, I'm in chapter six. Chapter four, verse sixteen. Um, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden and let its spices flow. Um, they're they're talking about sex here, so. Surprise, it's a book about marital love, and they're talking about sex. Surprise. Uh, basically, and it goes into it a little bit later right here. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat his choices fruit. She's his garden. He's talking about sex. Um, so uh, so it's, it's, it's intimate. The, the things, that, the things that, that we need to understand from this, okay, is that the world is blowing things out of proportion on one side. We need to know what the Bible says. And the Bible says that your love can be intense, restrained, patient, intimate, and mutual. Just like it was in the Garden of Eden, it needs to be again today. Mutual. See what I mean? You're not, you read Song of Solomon, and do you ever see the guy say, You will love me. No, you don't see that. Do you see him abusing her and then making her feel bad if she wants to leave the relationship? No, because it's a mutual love. See what I mean? He wasn't abusing her. She wasn't teasing or manipulating him. It was a mutual love. They felt these things for each other. See what I mean? So once again, it was intense and intimate. They, absolutely, marriage can be those things. Mar sex is not just for procreation. It, it can be these things. But it also needs to be restrained. It needs to be patient. See what I mean? We don't let lust overcome us where, where we devour another person, regardless of whether that person's our spouse or not. We don't let our lust devour other people. That's not how we live as Christians. So, um, and, and what I mean by devouring another person, when a guy is, is overcome with lust for someone and he presses the girl into it, you know what I mean? Where maybe she's not willing, maybe she doesn't really want to, maybe she just did it so that he would love her more, whatever. See what I mean? It, that's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a mutual affirmation between two people. Um, and then also we see here the permanency of it, the, the, the fact that it doesn't just fade in and out. Set me as a seal upon your heart in chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, something that, that, that bonds. I, I am bound to you. I'm sealed upon your heart. A seal, a seal is something that holds something and binds it shut. You know, like if you send a letter, you seal it, you seal the envelope. Is that seal me upon your heart? Um, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave, it's flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but that's one of the things um, why pornography isn't a good thing to allow in your marriage, besides the other obvious things, is because it'll make your spouse burn with jealousy. Look at this. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. You don't want to do something that's going to conjure your spouse to do that. So, um, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his health, house, he would be utterly despised. It can't be bought. So we see it is sensual, not wrong, passionate, not wrong, and it's loving, not wrong. See what I mean? And what people do nowadays is they just genuinely confuse love with lust. They genuinely confuse the two. Because what do we see in movies? If you really love someone, you'll put out for them. If you really love someone, you'll have sex with them. See what I mean? We don't see restraint in, in, in the culture today. We see have sex with whatever, whoever you want. Which is why I'm so surprised that people are still against the whole having sex with minor things. Because, I mean, like, where was it Turkey that I was reading about that it's legal? Or was it, was it Turkey? Where it's, you, can, you can have sexual relations with, with minors and stuff. Uh, creepy stuff. But anyways, um, love uh, is a good thing, and it doesn't... It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be lust. So, anyways, so then that takes us to Jesus. Jesus says some very, very important things that we have to keep in mind in any time we're talking about sex or lust or anything like that. 
because Jesus doesn't so much talk about... Do you know Jesus didn't talk about masturbation? Did, did you know that they masturbated back then? The, it, it's not a new concept. Masturbation has been around for thousands of years, but did you know Jesus didn't talk about it? Did, did you know that he didn't really talk about sex that much either? He talked about lust. He talked about the heart. Okay, so um, Matthew 5.28 is an example of what I'm talking about here. Um, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's already sinned in his heart. See what I mean? Not be, and what people have, some people have tried to do is they've tried to rationalize this. What he's saying is that when you lust after someone in your heart, you're more likely to go and do that thing. That's not what he said. He said, when you lust, you have done the action already. It is completed. You have committed adultery in your heart. The, the action is done with. Um, so, that, and then in chapter 19, verse 6, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no let uh, not man separate. And so he, he goes back to the um, to the verse that we talked about from Genesis uh, chapter two, verse twenty four. I think it was. Um, except he adds a little tidbit. Excuse me. At the end, that's not in the Bible in, in, in the Genesis account. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Why, why is that important? Because marriage and the sex that follows is something between the two people, yes, but it's also between God. You have made that covenant with God. See what I mean? And when you have sex, it is something that God condones. See what I mean? That's why that verse is important. Because he's saying sex is something that God created. And it's something that God has ordained and has covered you, and you as you do this in marriage. So don't let it be separated. See what I mean? So, anyways. Um, so, really, you see in, in, in Jesus' t uh, teachings about sex and sexuality and those kinds of things, he more talks about the heart, and he more talks about the attitude behind what you're doing. Um, so, to quote Foster, lust turns the other person into an object, a thing, a non-person. This is the greatest defense of, of pornography is that people are no longer people. And also, I'll add this too, if you're a man looking at pornography, you're going to have problems and attitude problems with women, especially women who are in authority positions. If you're a woman, well, then by looking at you know men, well, then vice versa, you're going to have a bigger problem with, with men in authority and that kind of thing. Um, so anyways, um, Jesus condemned lust because it cheapened sex. It made sex less than it was created to be. And that, that's exactly what pornography does. It, it's, that's not what sex was made to be. It's not about a, a five-second climax. It, it, sex is way more than that. Um, for Jesus, sex was too good, too high, too holy to be thrown away by cheap thoughts. And obviously that brings up the idea, well, did Jesus ever have sex? Was he, was he married? We'll look at that next week. Um, don't worry about it this week. We'll come back to that because I know a lot of people have asked that question. Um, so what about Paul? What does Paul say? Um, he compared the marriage covenant to the relationship of Christ with the church. I would say he had a pretty high view of sex. I would say he had a pretty high view of marriage. See what I mean? For him to compare it to Christ with the church, that's kind of a huge statement. Um, and obviously he condoned mutual sexual fulfillment in 1 Corinthians 7.3 is the verse that we'll look at next week for sexism, where he talks about... Um, I, I totally blanked. Uh, where he talks about, uh, hey, don't, spouses don't keep yourself from each other, be united in sex. And we'll talk about it next week, but he basically says, you know, hey, woman, uh, have sex with, with the man. And man, don't, don't, your body's not your own, but it's your wife's as well. So anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that next week, though. I don't really want to get too much into it. But the idea is that he condoned the mutual sexual fulfillment. He condoned sexuality. But once again, just as Jesus did, he also said that not everybody should be married. We'll look at that later, though. Because that's just now you see why we're going to be on lust for so long. We got a lot of things to talk about, <laughs> and just a lot of false ideas too. I'm sorry, did everybody get those that last slide? You don't have to write down the quote. You didn't read the quote. Oh, I didn't. Uh -uh. Oh, I'm sorry. Our sexuality is intimately tied to those we are as 
um, to who we are as spiritual persons. The spiritual life enhances our sexuality and gives a direction. Do you understand that? The spiritual life enhances our sexuality, but it also gives a direction. Okay? Our sexuality gives an earthly wholeness to our spirituality. See what I mean? Instead of just us being just these ascetic monks, it gives a certain pleasure in the world, okay? Um, our spirituality and our sexuality come into working harmony. See what he's saying there? Our spirituality is going to build in our sexuality, and our sexuality is going to build into our spirituality. And once again, we're talking about more than just sex here. We're talking about our, our, our man and womanness. He created as male and female. So we're talking about that male and female, okay? Um, <laughs> What? Oh, the dog? The dog just busted in, and he's like, oops. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's going on in here? There's stuff and things in here, guys. I'm out. I look better if I'm... Um, so that takes us to the idea of, of pornography. Now, pornography is going to be a little bit of a trickier thing because what we've done is we've starved young Christians of... Uh, what? Do you need me to go back on a slide? Do you need want me to go back or? No, no, no. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen is we're going to actually starve um, our our young our young developing Christians of their sexuality. So what they're going to do is they're going to hit about the age of 18 or 15 somewhere in there, and they're going to just explode sexually. And so then they're going to stumble upon porn, and it's going to be even worse for them because this is going to be their first encounter with their sexuality. See what I mean? And so because they've been starved of it, and this is their first encounter, they're going to overindulge, and they're just going to get way over-immersed, and it's going to lead to pornography addictions. Because, once again, this is something great. Oh, my gosh, this is great. And, 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 and they've never experienced this before. See what I mean? We need to remember that, that as parents, as, as people in the community, it, it, it's our task. It's our task to train our children about their sexuality. You know what I mean? Can you can you say that when you were a developing person, before you hit puberty, your, one of your parents pulled you aside and said, look, these are the things you're going to go through. You're going to feel like this. You're going to think like this. You're going to have these things happen to you. See what I mean? I, I, I know for me that that didn't happen. I started having those crazy erections as, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as an adolescent. I was way out of my, out of my mind. I didn't know what was, supposed, what was going to happen. Uh, Gracie, if I can use you as an example, yeah. uh, she started having her periods and she didn't know what the heck was going on. See what I mean? We can't let this happen as Christians. We have to train our kids in righteousness. We need to tell them what's what's happening. You know what I mean? They they shouldn't feel embarrassed. Not not. To, let me reword that. They shouldn't feel ashamed that their body is developing physically. They should be able to come to us and say, "Look, is this normal? I, I'm feeling these things," and we should be able to communicate with them those thoughts. Yes, you're going to feel these things. I, I know you feel really dramatic right now, but things aren't really what, what they seem. Your, your body is just producing these hormones that, that it's never produced before, and so you just feel out of whack. Give it some time, and your body will bounce back. You know what I mean? If I would have known that, that I wouldn't have always thought and felt like that as I was when I was a teenager, I would have been so much happier. But I thought there was something wrong with me. <laughs> like, I'm feeling so vulnerable. Why does anybody love me? You know what I mean? We need to we need to prepare our kids for, for these things. You know what I mean? We can't just throw them out into the world w without knowing what, what's coming. So sex has largely been rebuked historically. If you look at the history of the church, you see sex as something that that that, that is thrown out the door. In fact, I, I don't remember who, guys. I think it was Augustine, but I don't remember who. He said this that the Holy Spirit. Now now listen on this, guys. The Holy Spirit leaves. When, 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 the, when the married people have sex, and he comes back when they're done. I think that was Augustine. I don't remember if it was him for sure. But And you know what? He wasn't alone. A lot of people felt like sex was only for procreation in, in the church, in, in the historical church. Sex was only for procreation. It was something to be ashamed of. It was something that you couldn't enjoy. And in fact, a lot of times, people would look down on you if you did enjoy sex with your spouse. You couldn't lust after your wife. That was a no-no. So, I mean, all these different things where the sexuality, because they saw what the world did, the world went crazy with sex, so they tried to overcompensate by just muting it. 
and it didn't work. It left people frustrated. Do you know what I mean? It, it didn't resolve the issue of the heart because that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Anyways, so pornography is going to come, and it's going to become a distortion of sexuality. Um, it makes sex trivial, uninteresting, and dull. It makes sex something that it wasn't meant to be. It's boring in pornography. If you looked at pornography for over five years, I'm sure you could attest to this, you start getting bored of things. You want to see things more exciting, right? So that's what we call an escalation. And what that means is when somebody becomes addicted. Remember when we were talking about addiction? When somebody becomes addicted to something, they need a greater high to fulfill that same level of, of, of happiness. So then, because of that, pornography is going to be a main instigator of child abuse and child sexual abuse. It's also going to be a main, a main, a main instigator in um, uh, household abuse. Uh, like situations between an abusive relationship, pornography is going to be a big factor in this because people need this. The, the, they need more and they need more because they're becoming open to sexuality at a younger age because of the internet and whatnot. And, and our parents, as parents, we aren't we aren't controlling you know what what's allowed into our house. The TV's on, the internet's on, free access. They have phones that they get onto the internet. They're opened up to sexuality at a very young age, and because we aren't teaching them how to deal with it. They're going overboard. I was just reading about a kid who was uh, 11 or 12 and raped his 9-year-old sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read that. And uh, was charged for it, obviously. And why? Because there's this big world of sexuality that, that, that they're new to. They're, they're ready to explore. Remember the first couple times you had sex? How, how unique it was? See what I mean? Be because it was new to you. And so these 12-year-olds, these 14-year-olds... Same thing is happening with them. All the more we need to reaffirm what the Bible actually says, and we need to make sure that we're, we're holding ourselves that standard too. You know what I mean? For the long time, what's happened? Homosexuality, don't legalize. It's completely immoral. However, I'm looking at porn at my office without my wife knowing. I'm not sure you've read the whole Bible. I'm pretty sure you stopped at Sodom and Gomorrah and just kind of left the rest alone. You need to go back and read all of it because God hates sin over here as much as he hates sin over there. He will not. Eat, he does not enjoy it anywhere if you guys saw the uh, green eggs and ham. Anyways, um, so obviously pornography is going to be a main instigator to these things. Um, and what, what may, one of the things with it is it, it makes it only physical. Pornography makes it where it's only physical. It's all about the release. It's all about the lust of the moment. Pornography is a very dangerous thing. It's, it's like a drug. And if left unchecked, it can potentially ruin your relationships, your job. I mean, lust is a serious matter. Um, it's dehumanizing. Whenever you, As you continue to watch porn, as you continue to watch these kinds of things, you're not going to see people as people. Even people... Have you guys seen um, Silence of the Lambs? Yeah, with with, with, with this uh, cannibal Hannibal, cannibal Hannibal. <laughs> um, anyways, they they make this comment in this that the lust starts with the thing that's before you, and they figured out that one of the girls, the the initial victim, was someone that the guy lived right across from. Because he saw her all the day, all the time. What happened? Lust started to develop. Lust started to develop. He kept, he kept going after it, playing it over and over in his head. The lust was left unchecked. And what happened from it? He had to escalate it to get that same thrill. See what I mean? And then it got dark in the movie. If you guys remember, if you guys remember, it just got dark. But anyways, um, it, it dehumanized the factor. In fact, if you remember how how the serial killer talks to his victim, he says like this. It takes the lotion and it rubs it on itself. He doesn't address her by her name. He doesn't. See what I mean? He talks about it in a, in a cold way. I, I know that's like, why am I bringing up that movie? Because I'm trying to show you guys the way that lust dehumanizes people. It may start on the internet, but but rest assured, it will end with people you know, people you care about, to our even incest. See what I mean? Even um, what's it called? Bestiality. Even these things. Because it escalates. See what I mean? All of a sudden, sex, what, the, this great pure thing that God created, is twisted into pornography. And then, 
this foul thing is twisted even further. So I mean, and, and it becomes just this this hollow thing, which is not what God intended. So I'm gonna blow through the rest of this. Uh, it turns into fantasy based. It's not reality based. It's based on on, on hypothetical situations. You know, things that don't actually exist. Um, and in fact, that's one one of the things I was gonna say because of. Because of the view of the church, what women for a long time were actually not even allowed to have um, – it's awkward to say it, but or orgasms. And a woman was actually kind of looked down on if that was to happen. Um, men could because they had to get the seed to the egg, but as far as women, no. See what I mean? And so because of that, some other things developed that we don't really need to get into. But um, I just want you to see that that's how the, how the church took it, but then the world took it this other way. And, and now it's all based on, on things that aren't real. It's, it's, a, it's a virtual world. It's, it's something that doesn't actually exist. You're chasing things that, that are a dream. That, that, they don't actually exist out there. You know what I mean? And, and pornography is so destructive in this way. Uh, it turns sex into a power struggle. On, on pornography, you always hear them say stuff like, yeah, oh yeah, I take it, B. They're calling each other names. They're, they're doing degrading things to each other. And it's being recorded for other people to watch. Oftentimes, they have a whole camera crew in there while these people are having sex. See what I mean? It, it takes that, and it becomes a power struggle. So now we have movies like Fifty Shades of Grey, which emphasize only the power struggle between sexuality that thing that was part of the curse is now a great thing in sex. And where S&M, sadism and masochism, is now a good thing, whereas that was part of the curse. See what I mean? It, and where's the intimacy between the husband and wife? Where's the oneness? Where's the purity? See what I mean? It's been removed from the equation. So, the effects. I'm just going to read through those. First off, over-attention to fantasy. This, this eventually spreads into other areas of, uh, of your life. You'll be less satisfied at work. Um, less satisfied with your family, you'll need to do more things to to get to get to fulfill yourself with adrenaline. You'll buy more game systems, more games, uh, you know, more things that you think will will make you happy, but then just leads into a spiral where you need more and more and more. Um, erectile dysfunction, yes, pornography actually causes erectile dysfunction. So if you're a man and you feel like having sex with your wife, don't look at pornography. It's gonna hurt. Um, uh, decreased sexual drive, yes, you heard me. Looking at pornography actually decreases your sexual diet drive. It also makes you find your spouse less attractive. Yeah. Bad things, guys. Bad things. Um, increased irritability and critical attitude. These go hand in hand, but the ir increased irritability, basically things start setting you off. Uh, you expect more and more from people, um, and that goes right hand in hand with the critical attitude. Um, you overanalyze people. You feel guilty, so you criticize yourself. You criticize your spouse. Why didn't you do this better? Why didn't I do this better? Just kind of that the same kind of thing over and over again. Um, excuse me. Uh, objectifying of others. Your mom isn't isn't your mom who nurtured you. All of a sudden, she's this this um, you know this, this terrible person who's only trying to ruin your life. See what I mean? You just your your perspectives start changing. Um, dissatisfaction in life and relationships. I already kind of talked about this. It's very common for people in pornography to go from relationship to relationship. Um, Mm, growing guilt and remorse. Um, at, at the longer you look at pornography, the longer this is a factor. Until eventually, you reach you reach a point of kind of apathy where you don't really want to get out, you don't really enjoy it, but you just continue doing it. And it's just kind of this endless repetitive cycle. Um, yeah, and obviously you become reclusive. Um, you, you you do things that 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 require you to not be around other people, stuff like that. Um, now, I'm not saying being an introvert is a sin. But I'm saying if you're looking at pornography for long enough, you're probably going to become introverted in a lot of things. Um, emotional harm, this one kind of goes without saying. Uh, emotionally, it's going to scar you and devastate you. It's going to affect all of your future relationships and, 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 and everything. So, uh, Unrealistic expectations, that goes hand in hand with the other things I said. Dominance over partner, no longer is it about mutual satisfaction. It's about dominance. You are the one in charge. You are the one who calls the shots. You are the see what I mean, and you start looking down on your spouse. Um, feelings of being trapped. It, it's kind of like you feel like you're in a prison. It, it builds with anxiety, and it, and it also couples with depression. Those those kind of things go hand in hand. If you already have a problem with depression or anxi anxiety, pornography is probably one of the worst things you can do for it. Um, and you would think, oh, well, an orgasm will help me calm down. It doesn't though. 
uh, pornography it, it builds a lot of tension and it builds a lot of insecurity in you where you're going to look down on yourself. Um, sleep problems, a lot of times uh, pornography leads to, leads to what's that called um, when you can't get to sleep? Uh, insomnia. Uh, a lot of times pornography causes insomnia and other sleep problems. Um, uh, encouragement of sex trafficking. Um, the the sex and in, the pornography industry is actually one of the lead causes for sex trafficking, which is you know where you kidnap someone and sell them as a sex slave, that kind of stuff. Um, pornography is a big instigator of that. In fact, a lot of times people who are involved with pornography are oftentimes also involved with sex with sex trafficking rings. Um, so kind of a big deal there. Um, let's see. Uh, increased risk of abuse and rape in children and adults. I already mentioned this, though. Uh, pornography is a big factor to abuse uh, and abusive relationships. Um, in fact, oh my gosh, this one made me so mad. There, there, there was this girl who uh, who had this... Oh, I, I, oh, I, this one really makes me mad. She had this uh, baby girl, um, and I believe it was uh, 12 or 16 months when it, when it died. Um, and the father and the uncle uh, sexually abused it. Um, and, and, and the woman, the mom, knew... And she just let it happen the whole time. And finally, the baby died from sexual abuse. Okay, um, the 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 baby the body was just terribly mangled. Well, well, how can people get to that point in little steps? And it starts with the lust of the heart, and it builds into pornography, and it builds into other things. Lust is a powerful thing, guys. The the Christian who is doomed to fail is the Christian who doesn't take seriously that they are a sex sexual being. We are. A sexual beings and we have to figure out what the Bible says and what we have to do about our sexuality. We have to figure these things out, guys. Um, <clears throat> and it also misses the idea of true sexuality and it blows it completely out of proportion. In fact, I tell you what, it's a terrible thing when, when people who have looked who, who, or who look at porn get married. It, 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 the thing is meant to be such a beautiful thing that connects two people and, and it actually just turns into more of a thing of, of, of judging. Uh, and it just it just really gets to be a terrible thing. So, anyways, we'll talk more about pornography in the future. I just wanted to kind of outline pornography as a whole. Uh, we'll look at uh, later on. We'll talk about well, what qualifies as pornography? If it's cartoon porn, for instance, is that really pornography because it's a cartoon? We'll we'll, we'll look at that in the future. Um, examples of lust in every day. This is our last slide, and the and the, the reason why this is the last thing I'm leaving you with is I want you to see that lust isn't just about sex. Lust isn't just about pornography. Here are some everyday examples of lust. Binge watching television, where you can't just watch a show and turn it off and be done. Binge, binge playing video games, where you sit there and you waste all of your days every day playing video games. See what I mean? It's become a thing of lust. You're always, you're always wanting but never attaining. You're always, you're always seeking this thing that, that's not there. See I mean, I mean that's the idea of a video game, and I play video games all the time, so I, I'm not judging you guys for that's I'm, I'm not judging that. What I'm judging is excess. Okay, that that that's the problem when our heart is allowed free range with whatever we allow it to, to 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 have. We look down on the alcoholic, but yet then we do some other things that are very much so guided by lust. So we need to make sure that that lust doesn't have a part in our lives. Because lust is the problem. It's something that runs rampant in us. Sex is not the problem. Money is not the problem. Our hearts are the problem. And that's what causes greed, the idea that it's mine. And then lust. I mean, we'll talk about a definition later on. But um, Overeating. Instead of just eating what you need to survive, all of a sudden your life is all about eating. You eat all the time, everything. It's how you deal with stuff. It's how you. It's it, it's what you're always thinking about. After you eat, you're thinking about the next meal. You know, all these different things. You 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 waste all your money on eating out all the time. So, I mean, that's not what we were made to be. Um, oversleeping, rather than getting what's necessary, going to the extreme of oversleeping. Now, I'm not talking about, like, for instance, um, if you're pregnant like Gracie, for instance, you, you're going to be getting more sleep. Be because your body's going to be tired all the time, you, you need that extra energy because you're producing a baby inside of you. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna take a little bit out of you. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm also not talking about where like you have a condition or you take medication that makes you sleepy or you're a senior citizen. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about where you should get up and do something responsible and you say, no, nah, I'm just gonna sit around and be lazy. That indulgence of that. That's what I'm talking about. That lustful attitude. Um, buying on credit rather than saying I need this, so I'm gonna save up my money and then buy it. 
Instead, I'm just going to look at random things, and if, as soon as I find something that, that I fancy, I'm going to buy it. It doesn't matter if I need it or not. I'm just going to buy it. And because I don't have the money for it, because I'm always buying things I don't need, I'm going to buy it on the credit card. See what I mean? The, that irresponsible mentality, it, it, it's really rooted in lust. And we'll look at this. There, there's, there's, the root, there's the surface things, and then you go down to the different levels to the root cause of something, and then there's a root, there's a root to the root cause. It's a four-step process. I'll, I'll show it to you in a few weeks. Um, uh but then there's, uh, you know, pornography. Sex is a good thing. You know, hey, God, or God condoned it. He created it. It's a beautiful thing. But yet, blown out of proportion once again. Pornography. Um, adultery or sexual activity outside of marriage. These are the things, good examples of lust in everyday life. So as you can see, lust isn't something that just revolves around pornography. Lust involves a lot of things in our lives. And so that takes us to the question of the week. I asked it last week. I asked at the beginning of this uh, of this lesson. I'm going to ask it again. What is lust, and how do you overcome this thing? Because clearly it's not just about sex. So what is it, and how do you overcome such a thing? Uh, any questions before I stop the recording? No? Okay. I'm going to stop it. I'm for real. I'm really going to do it.